thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for coming. Um, this is a very intimidating place to be. <laughs> I have a television show, which I mean, I, I know technically is sort of like public speaking, but I can't see anybody's face <laughs> when I do that, so you're freaking me out. Um, I will also say just tonight, especially feeling the, the gravitas and the um, moral weight of this place, I know there's a lot of things to be paying attention to in the world right now other than a book. And so to see you all here and to be together to talk about this topic really moves me. So thank you. Um, Rachel, I'd rather not listen to your boring book because you are here to get Israel born in the Bronx and I lived in Harlem till I was about five actually. Then my parents decided they wanted to get away from the city so they moved to a little town called Plainfield, New Jersey and I went to elementary and middle school there um, and then they got divorced and so my mom and I came back to the city and her and I, <laughs> funny enough, we were living, we were renting a room together and we were sharing a twin size bed for a few months and then we upgraded where we got a cot. I'm a freshman in high school and she's working two jobs. Um, she's working in Dunkin Donuts during the day and Marshalls in the afternoon and so I never saw her during the day. I'd come home and she wasn't there. We'd only get an apartment and I'd only have my own room when we moved into the Bronx when I was about 15. So I was a sophomore in high school. So in 2013, you first encountered the LaRouche movement. Can you talk a little bit about that? In 2013, I was going to a high school, Manhattan Hunter Science High School. Um, and it wasn't a specialized high school until about two years after I was admitted into. So about the time I was a junior, it became a, a specialized high school. And I would see these tables uh, from the LaRouche people. I would make fun of them. Or I would just say something like, uh, you know, that's incredibly racist, whatever. And it's funny because those people then become my friends. <laughs> the people who are behind those tables. Uh, and, you know, one day I just said, okay, all right, let me entertain. Let me, let me, let me go at a table here. Let me, let me, let me figure out what, what this is all about. And so I would talk with the organizers and they, they'd tell me stuff. I had no idea what the hell they were talking about. What, what did Obama do? Why? Why should he be, you know, tried for prison or something? Or why should he be impeached? Because that was a big thing, impeach Obama. Um, and I would go home and Google, well, why should Obama be impeached? And, you know, and I would get all the Republican answers, like, you know, he's, he's done, you know, constitutional overreach or whatever the Republicans were saying at the time, not anything about his war crimes or anything that he was committing or 
And at the time, I didn't really know about Edward Snowden either. And that was when the Snowden story, I think, was starting to get leaked. And Obama had called Snowden a hacker with a laptop. I'm not going to be scrambling jets uh, to get a 29-year-old uh, hacker. Anyway, I decided to go to a Schiller Institute meeting. And they start talking. And like, I don't understand anything that they're saying, right? And I, I'm kind of intimidated a little bit because like these people clearly know what they're talking about and I don't. And so that's kind of where it all started right there. I wanted to know what this was about and that was my political awakening, my real political awakening where I became cognizant of all the injustices of the world and the way the world really works. Wow. Huh. Unconfirmed. Unconfirmed. Yeah. Unconfirmed. No. Unconfirmed reports about Gaddafi being captured. The way I see politics and, you know, what the Schiller Institute has influenced me on it is that, you know, it's not about policy. A president can't just wave his hand and fix society. You have to see what's influencing the culture and the society that dictates the policy that you have now. The reason why you have such insane policies and the reason why you have such an insane foreign policy of invading every other country is because you have a culture that doesn't prioritize human life. We came, we saw, <laughs> he died. <laughs>
We all have knowledge inside us, but we just need someone to take it out from us. Thank you. So I would talk about this with my global economics teacher and also my media literacy teacher too. I'd tell her, you know, oh, I just joined this political group. They're great. They're called the, they're called the LaRouche organization. Um, they've been around since the seventies, you know, they're like some of the coolest people. Uh, they want Glass-Steagall back and they want, you know, a bank holiday. And she tells me, I want those things. Wow. That's great. We had this whole conversation back and forth. The next day, she's like, Jose, can I talk to you for a second? Here, and then she turns her laptop to me. I think you're in a cult. <laughs> I was like, what? I, I had to act surprised, because like, I already, what she's showing me, I had already read. So I'm like, what? No, oh, damn. And so, never talked to her again about the LaRouche organization. My expectation is that this will be an extremely productive and exciting year for this city council and for the people of Burlington. Welcome aboard. Today, I am proud to announce my candidacy for President of the United States of America. So in late 2014, early 2015, I was introduced to Bernie Sanders through my global economics teacher. Um, you know, he was getting a little bit of traction because um, first there were whispers of him running and we were all New Yorkers so we didn't really understand why that was such a big deal. And she like explained to us who Bernie Sanders was and what a revolutionary he was. And then he announced his candidacy. And I remember there was Bernie fever. There were all these memes. He was trending on social media. So I, I, I was like, okay, I'm all for Bernie. You know, he seems to be an outsider of the establishment. Uh, you know, I had anti-establishment fever at the time. Our message has resonated much faster, much further than I thought it would. And, uh, you know, I was like, okay, yeah, I'm gonna, I think Bernie Sanders is my guy for president. I think we are touching a nerve with the American people who understand that establishment politics is just not good enough. We need bold changes. We need a political revolution. I started the election season as a Bernie bro, and I ended as a Trump voter. How stupid are the people of Iowa? How does that happen? Somebody hits me with a belt's going in because the belt moves this way. It moves this way. It moves that way. Well, like I was saying, I. I had anti-establishment sentiments. I knew Hillary Clinton was a bitch, just to put it straightforward. Senator Sanders wasn't really a Democrat until he decided to run for president. He doesn't even know what the you know, last two Democratic presidents did. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, well, it's true. It's true. You know it's true. I knew she was evil. Um, and, uh, you know, I was like, Bernie's my guy. And then he lost the primary. Make him go. And then it gets revealed in the WikiLeaks emails that Hillary Clinton conspired to get him out of the race. You're back in the news, of course, because WikiLeaks uh, released thousands and thousands of emails from the Democratic National Committee. And there was like inner establishment in the Democratic Party working against one of their own people to get Hillary Clinton the nomination. Do you think this is fair game? Well, it, it, it was definitely good fun. And I was just so pissed off at that. I was like, what the hell? Like, okay, what happened to, quote, democracy? You know, you guys got to fight for the nomination. You can't play dirty. You can't play unfair. What, what is this? And then what really pissed me off was that Bernie didn't want to fight it either. He then endorsed Hillary Clinton. I was like, how do you get fucked in the ass and then bend over for them again? Like, come on. Sorry, is that okay for me to... Oh, yeah, no, that's great. 
Yeah, okay. That's very on brand. Have you seen our show? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, he gets fucked in the ass, and then he bends over again and says, please, sir, can I have some more? I want to thank Bernie Sanders. I didn't really know what to believe. I was kind of disillusioned in the whole electoral politics system. That's kind of when I realized, like, there's no real democracy in this country anymore. If you can just conspire to do that and get away with it, too. So I look over at the Republican side and I see this guy Trump who announces and I'm like, okay, well, the media hates him. Hillary hates him. Fuck it. I like this guy because everybody hates him. And so as I'm becoming like politically awakened and I'm seeing all the injustices around the world, I'm seeing the injustices here in the country, I'm just thinking, well, maybe anything is better than what we have now on the virtue that because he's not them, maybe it'll be a net positive instead of a net negative. Donald J. Trump will become the 45th president of the United States, defeating Hillary Clinton in a campaign unlike anything we've seen in our lifetime. Do I regret supporting him? No, I don't regret supporting him. I am glad that he beat Hillary because I think the events that have transpired in Ukraine would have just happened four years earlier had Hillary Clinton won. So it was kind of a delay in that. When he sanctioned Venezuela, that was a pretty big no-no for me. And then he killed Soleimani, and that was another big no-no for me. When he lost the election, I was like, okay, well, maybe he'll pardon Assange and Snowden. Because he was saying he would pardon them. Didn't happen. And then there was word that Bill Barr kind of convinced him not to. And that was like the final, like, okay, you know what? I can't believe I let all of this slip by. You killed Soleimani. You uh, put these sanctions on Venezuela that starved thousands of people there. Um, and you didn't even pardon Assange and Snowden, which you said you would do. And that to me was kind of like the final nail in the coffin where I don't trust anyone anymore. <laughs> In 2018, the ceiling in your apartment collapsed. Uh, can you explain how this affected you and what its influence was long term on your politics and where the journey to get justice for that ended you up? Yeah, in 2018, my apartment had collapsed and basically like my whole life was turned upside down there. One tenant's weekend was anything but relaxing in Morris Heights. His apartment damaged, causing severe flooding. News for the Bronx reporter Asia McKenzie went to East 177th Street to check it out. Friday, the, just half of that wall came down. Jose Vega sending the cell phone video to News 12 of the aftermath of his ceiling dropping onto the floor, causing his Morris Heights basement apartment to become an unsanitary mess. I lived in a basement apartment at the time. So the water, there was sewage water that was leaking on the ceiling and every day it would just bubble down a little more. It was like a bulge that was kind of depressing down more and more and more until finally, it just collapsed. And then there was all this sewage water all over the place and it wouldn't stop falling. The super didn't want to do anything about it. I went to my councilman, Councilman Cabrera. At first his office was pretty helpful because they got Housing and Preservation Development or HPD, it's a local government agency that inspects all these houses. Cause when I called them, they said, no problem. We'll be out there in two weeks. He got them out there next day and, um, you know, then I told him I had gotten a lawyer pro bono. He says he called his landlord multiple times to tell him about the gaping hole in the ceiling and the water him and his mother have had to mop out the door. And his chief of staff told me, oh, so you're thinking of fighting this. You're thinking of, of, you know, suing the landlord. We get a hold of the landlord on Sunday. He told my mother, hey, um, if you want, I can rip up the lease we just signed a week ago and uh, just get your things out and leave. I said, yeah, and then I told him, but you know, I'm not the only one this is happening to. You know, I'm sure there's other stories like mine, but there's people who can't even speak English that this is happening to. You know, so I'm hoping we can do something to systemically change this because, you know, landlords shouldn't be getting away with this. 
And his chief of staff told me, well, you're the one in front of me right now. You can't really change everything at once. Let's just do one by one. We'll just start with you. So Councilman Cabrera's chief of staff told me, if somebody approached you with $15,000, would you take it to drop the whole case? You just move out, let it go. And I said, I would consider it if it was $999 million. And he said, don't be ridiculous. Use the money and go to school or organize and become a tenant advocate. And I said, I'm doing it right now. What are you, I'm trying to help you do that. And he said, come on, kid, don't be ridiculous. I, I, I understand your passion and your fire. And then the councilman walked in and he said, this guy's gonna be the mayor one day. Oh, you can tell what kind of spirit and passion he has. And so I left that day and then the chief of staff called my mother that same night and said, listen, if your son continues with litigation on this, you will never be able to rent an apartment in New York City again because your name is gonna be on a list. When I went back to the apartment the next day, the locks were changed. And that's illegal to do in New York City. You have to give a two week notice. And I called the police because I called my lawyer who said call the police and tell them that. And so there I am outside arguing with the super to let me in and the police arrive and they say, okay, well, is your name on the lease? And I say, no, my mother's name is on the lease. And they say, okay, well, can you get your mother here? I call my mom and my mom says, no, I don't approve of you fighting for this apartment. We're just going to move out and you're going to drop the whole thing. And, and so there I am outside of the apartment and I have the cops who don't believe me. They think I'm just some squatter because my stuff was still in there, my clothes and my books and some other things I had in there. And then I have the super who's telling the cops, yeah, man, they're crazy. You know, they're making all this up. You know, they said they wanted to move out anyway. And uh, I was just absolutely defeated at that time because um, it was the first time that I felt like I lost a battle or something. And um, I had reached out to AOC's team because um, she had just won the primary in New York. And I was so disillusioned with politics that she seemed like a real hope for people. She had just beat Joe Crowley. She had just beat the establishment candidate. I needed something to believe in. So I wrote an email to her team, you know, was saying, I don't know what to believe in anymore, but I just, you know, I, well, we were, we were homeless basically after that because we didn't have anywhere to go. And so I lived with my sister and my mom lived with my uncle for a few months. And, you know, um, I don't remember hearing back from AOC's team. And, um, you know, this was a primary. She had just won. And I thought she could use her media darling to, to bring attention to the injustice. And I just remember crying on a stoop because the cops had left and the super had left. And I just felt incredibly alone at that time. I didn't know what to do. I went through all the legal hoops. I went, I got a lawyer pro bono and the person who's supposed to be my advocate, my councilman, is threatening my mom with saying she can never rent an apartment again in, in New York City. What 
who do you go to? Where, where do you seek justice when the authority, when the justice makers aren't the ones who are supposed to help you? I was homeless for a bit, like three or four months or so, and my mom, grandpa, and I were separated because my mother lived with my uncle and my grandfather, and I lived with my sister for a bit. And, um, you know, it, was, it, it wasn't healthy for our relationship, I'll put it that way, because for one, uh, we would get into arguments all the time about that apartment, you know, blaming each other for how the way things ended and the circumstances and everything ended. And, um, you know, secondly, there was just, there was just a tension between us and the bad blood and, uh, you know, and also we were separated too. So, you know, I'm just like, whatever. And, uh, the way we got out of it was we found a one-bedroom apartment up in Norwood, like north of the Bronx, last stop on the D train. Um, it was a one-bedroom apartment, tiny apartment, split between myself, my mother, and my grandfather. None of us were happy campers, and we stayed there for about a year or so. And we were, I, I did my best to get out of the house as much as I could, just because like I couldn't be in there. My room was in the living room, so my room wasn't really so you know you'd have a kitchen and then there's my bed right there and then that place was roach infested and rat infested and it was like fifteen hundred dollars for one bedroom it was not a good time um and thankfully we found this place where i live now so, you know now i'm known as the guy who yells at politicians but i didn't really start out that way actually um i tried to do all the right steps, as you say. And it goes back to the apartment thing because I went to my councilman's office and he was actually the most help I got because I went to my assemblywoman. Uh, here's some numbers for legal resources. I didn't use any of them to get the lawyer. I got pro bono. I went to my congressman office, Jose Serrano. His office was no help because that was his last term in Congress. He was out the door already, so they didn't really care. They, I never got any follow-up from them. So my councilman was the way to go. After that, um, I worked on a congressional campaign in South Dakota. And I was really happy I did because I learned about what was happening over there and how the farmers were suffering over there and how um, they were going through floods and they wouldn't get their farms or their uh, infrastructure repaired. Um, they wouldn't get the aid. And I learned how farmers are really like, you know, fucked. I got an opportunity to understand the other side of the coin of how other people live, too. It's not just in the cities, it's the whole country. Your first intervention was with Adriano Espiat in 2019. <laughs> you forgot Victoria Nuland. Oh, Victoria Nuland. I told you I was going to get in trouble. That's right. <laughs> The woman who funded Nazis in Ukraine, who your party helped elect. All right, very To good. overthrow the Ukrainian government on, and to put a, uh, the coup against the president. Okay. Why do you support that? Why do you, you don't, you don't serve the, uh, the veterans? You don't honor the veterans? Okay. If you honored the veterans, you would actually support them. You would not support the coup your party has presented. Why did you help Victoria Nuland put Nazis in Ukraine? Now, this is when Trump is still president, it's before the war, but you called him out for supporting Ukrainian Nazis. Why did you know about that at that time? Uh, one, because Max Rhodes and others, other congressmen, including Hakeem Jeffries, put out this letter saying, hey, uh, what's going on with the Azov Battalion in Ukraine? Why is our money being used for the Azov Battalion? We should not be giving resources to the Azov Battalion. But even four years before that, there was the Maidan coup. And so the Maidan coup was extensively reported on by our organization. That was the first instance of where I understood how the United States conducts coups around the world. That, on top of the shelling that was going on in the Donbass, so Ukraine, there's the west and east, and the western part is shelling the eastern part of Ukraine. 
um, you know, this is provoking the Russians to do something. And then NATO keeps expanding east, so we needed to go out there and do something. So I went out to Espayat because he was, well, he was the nearest one. I saw he had an event going on. And I was alone that day. I just set my camera on the little cup. And as Espayat starts thanking people, uh, you know, it was a Veterans Day event too. So I was like really scared because like there was like veterans in there who could probably kick your ass, but they were all like old, like 70 plus. So I don't think I had anything to worry about. I believe strongly that the Ukraine facing a major assault from Russia and the Kurds facing a major assault from Al Qaeda and ISIS have been our traditional allies. And we should honor that allegiance by respecting them. Those that fought hand in hand in the trenches next to us. And I will fight to continue to honor them. Thank you for your opinion. We'll be back to you. No, no, no. How do you sit there and lie like that? Why don't you take Jerry Mandler's hand out your ass and talk for yourself? You ever thought about that? Oh, being disrespectful. Look at the people in your community. Come on, log it off, log it off. Look at the people in your community. Poorest district, and all you can do is try and impeach the president. In October of 2021, one year, almost exactly one year before I did the AOC intervention, I intervened on Kamala Harris. I remember that day, I, I woke up around like 9 a.m. or 9.30 and I get a call. And the call is like, hey, Jose, uh, Kamala Harris is coming to the Bronx. And I'm like still half asleep, like what? Yeah, she's speaking at the YMCA up north in the Bronx. Today? Yeah, in like 30 minutes. I don't even like change out of my pajamas. I just go, I just put on a jacket and, um, and I just, I just go. And when I get to the YMCA, at first, I'm like scoping the area, like how the hell am I supposed to get in? And so I see there's like a line of families, all very well dressed, all like spiffied up. And I get behind that line, the last guy. And so they start checking people in because they were all supposed to have a photo op with Kamala Harris. They were only letting residents of the neighborhood come in. And even then I was talking to the people on the line. Oh, I'm a community organizer. Oh, I'm a principal. I'm a teacher. We do organizing for the Democratic Party. So all the people who were coming to the event were only Democratic Party insiders. So there I am and I see a lady with a clipboard. There's a lady with a clipboard and, like, and I see names on there. I'm able to peek through the fence and I see a name as like Thomas Moore or something. I'm like, okay, Thomas Moore, Thomas Moore, that's my name, that's my name. So um, as we're walking and the line's getting closer, I'm behind this lady, this big lady, and she's got like three kids with her. And what happens is she's like, my name is this and these are my kids and their name's not on the list, but they're coming in. I swear to God, and if they don't get in, I'm not coming in, I'm not gonna come in here until da, 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 ba, 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 ba. Beautiful. So the lady with the clipboard is so freaked out because she doesn't know how, she's like a little petite lady, she doesn't know how to handle this. She's like, oh, okay, 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 no problem, no problem. I don't even say a name, I just walk in with her. The lady with the clipboard is so freaked out, she doesn't even bother like trying to get my attention. And right there I knew, coast was clear, I'm in. And so the security guards pat me down, he's like, hey man, how's it going today? I'm like, it's great, I'm gonna see my favorite vice president, Kamala Harris, that, that, that. it's gonna be awesome. And so I sit down in the audience and I'm sweating and I'm like almost hyperventilating because like I really am afraid and scared. And the other thing is like, what am I gonna say exactly? There's so much to go after this airhead for. She was coming to promote the Build Back Better plan. On climate, it's about better health. It's about better jobs. And at the time, maybe like a week or so or two weeks before we had that hurricane, Hurricane Ida. Eight people had drowned in their basement. And we knew that those were flood zones since the 70s. But it wasn't even the flood zones that killed them. They were stuck in their apartments with all this water rushing in from the toilets because the sewer system got backed up. And so the water from the sewage system is what killed them. 
and intentionally, it is about our families. So she wants to come here and talk about Build Back Better. So when she finally stood up, I said, this what about the families who drowned? Eight families drowned here in Queens. It could have been prevented if we had the right infrastructure. You are right about that. I am right about I that. This was around the time when an article had come out from the BBC saying the Chinese successfully stopped poverty in their country or something. So everybody in China was now, or virtually everybody, was living above the international poverty line. And, and the Chinese have shown that, that poverty is a choice. So Why you. aren't we working with the Chinese on their Belt and Road Initiative? Okay, the bankers run a dictatorship back, here. Right? And so I said, why aren't we working with the Chinese on their Belt and Road Initiative? Because the Chinese, with every administration, they always invite the president to be a part of the Belt and Road Initiative. And Trump denied it, Biden denied it. And so I said, why aren't we working with them, you know? Um, and I, I forget what else I said after that, but as I was getting dragged out, which is like the best thing ever, you know. And we I'm need to pass to Glass-Steagall back. But right now, let's talk about the agenda. No, the agenda doesn't address the fact that people are going to die. If you know, the scariest thing about, a, about an intervention is not what you say. It's actually standing up and breaking the tension. Because once you actually stand up and you get the first words out of your mouth, you've done the hardest part already. Then, when you're actually going and you're saying whatever you're saying, it feels like you're flying almost, like you're untouchable. You've already done the deed you're not supposed to do. You've broken the social contract. You're in uncharted territory and it feels amazing, actually, because you're doing something nobody else in the audience had the guts to do and you don't really know what the consequences are in the moment, but in that moment, you're in control. You have the power. You command that room. Even if it's for 30 seconds or a minute, that's all you. That's your moment. In all of history, and all of time and space, you know, I believe that life is a constant dialogue between the past, present, and future. And that point when you stand up and you speak truth to power is an inflection point. In history, everything gets changed after that. And that's you forever. do more on lowering prescription drug costs. We could do more on gun control. We could do more with regards to the black agenda. We can do more. Well, I confronted Jamal Bowman in September of 2022. This was maybe like a couple weeks before I did the AOC intervention. Congressman, and you're a hypocrite because you are funding neo-Nazis in Ukraine. They are wearing the Ukrainian, they are wearing the black sun symbol. The same symbol that the Buffalo shooter used the same symbol that the guy, that the person who almost killed the vice president in Argentina used. Thank you, you so much. You say you want to advance the black cause, but you are funding the same people who who kill in the name of white supremacy. And you know he's like completely just like uh, like this is what he does. I guess he's like trying to say like give him the floor, you know, like First Amendment, you know. This okay, is the this is the, the foundation. This is the foundation of our democracy, freedom of speech. Uh, you know, like this is him in the video. Like, uh. Stick around and I will have a conversation with you right after the end. But let me get to the conclusion. He does, I stick around and I'll talk to you after. And I say, you promise. And like, I did want to talk to him, you know. I promise, I got you. So I, I stick around and I talk to him afterwards. It took like 40 minutes for him to come to me. The foundation of our democracy is freedom of speech. Freedom of speech. So finally Bowman comes up to me. He's like, yo, man, what, what, what was that about, man? Come on, man. You could have pulled me to the side and said, Mr. Bowman, you know, we got the X, Y, Z. What, 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 
you didn't have to come at me. I was like, Mr. Bowman, you know, you said you were going to take questions. You didn't take questions. Yeah, but still, come on, man. You know, come on. You could have pulled me to the side. I said, what's up, Mr. Bowman? I said, okay, well, anyway, and are you even a constituent of mine? What, what is this, man? And I said, well, no, I'm part of Richie Torres' district, one district below you. So you're not even my constituent, man. You're not even my constituent. You're coming all yelling at me like, Mr. Bowman, what's it? What, 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 come on. All right, well, listen, Mr. Bowman, all decisions you make affect everyone. You're funding neo-Nazis just as Richie Torres is. So what are we going to do on that? And I think his exact words were something like, we're going to do... We're gonna do the work on what we came, that we're gonna keep doing what we came to do on the work we said we're gonna do. Something like that. And he just left. <laughs>
You're the liar here. Okay, so those are actual progressives. Now, there's no doubt that on virtually any other issue, we wouldn't agree with them. Don't know what their beliefs are, probably don't intersect with ours. But on this specific issue, which does matter, they're absolutely right. Let your conscience come for once. Yeah. I won't get to your issue. I'm not even ignoring what you have to say. I'm not even ignoring what you have to say. What I'm saying is that what I'm asking is that you respect all these people who are sitting here and have been waiting, and you're standing up and putting together. Yes or no question. And I know you may be. At that time I went to sleep, I wake up, it had a million views. And like a million views at the time felt like, oh my God, like we just, we hit the jackpot, you know? Now if I post an intervention and it doesn't get at least 100,000 views, I'm like, wow, it's a fucking bust. You guys are some of the most famous guys we've ever spoken to now. <laughs> Believe it or not, maybe, maybe you guys like, are like the biggest celebs know. we've ever had. I, I was just completely blown away at like the reaction and then it just kept getting bigger and bigger and then Jesse Waters covered it on his show on Fox News and then he had Tulsi Gabbard come on the show. I don't know what happened to her uh, or what she believes in. And I was like, <laughs> and Tulsi Gabbard was like, I want to Thank those boys for being brave and being sincere in their, you know, anti-war efforts. I hope everyone was paying attention to what those two young men were saying and paying attention to the pain and the anguish and the fear and the concern that they were expressing. Come on, right? I didn't think I could have that kind of effect. And then uh, Tucker Carlson did it. I was like, oh shit, we hit like, that's like the most viewed, you know, conservative news source, everything, right? Her response, you are being rude. Oh, you're being rude now, says the very same Sandy Cortez who instructed activists to terrorize their political opponents. Quote, the whole point of protesting is to make people uncomfortable. Oh, is that right? So they were kind of following your instructions, weren't they? Honestly, I was very happy to see the unity between the disgruntled left so people who were upset with the Democratic Party, who may have left the Democratic Party, people who maybe were like, I'm on the left, I think we should have like a socialist-like government. You know, we thought AOC was the real deal and we're not. Agreeing with people who were conservatives, you know, for a moment there was this beautiful window. Everybody was saying the same thing. This intervention was legit and it was good. So how did you feel about AOC's dismissive reaction to your intervention, claiming you're not really anti-war, that you're in a cult? I think the fact that she had to respond at all showed that we really kicked her ass on that because the best PR strategy in anything is ignore and let it go. And if they can ignore it, well, that means, that means we had a real breakthrough on something. AOC was asked about this, and she gave the following response. Could you speak on being confronted by anti-war protesters? She says, sure. They were actually not anti-war protesters. They were right-wing Trumpers, and some were LaRouche cult members, not progressives as they claimed. Their own social media history shows this. So now they got to send the pro-war shit live army out to defend AOC and smear the activists. You guys think I was making this up? So this is Mehdi Hassan. Uh, this is one of the dumbest things I've ever seen. What? Screaming hysterically about opposing war while praising Tulsi Gabbard, avoiding any mention of Putin, <laughs> and blaming AOC. It was a stunt that they do from time to time. Last time they showed up to a town hall yelling about eating babies or something. It's a thing they do to go viral and draw in people. One protester accused AOC of voting to start this war in Ukraine. So this is Maddie going after you. God know who else have chimed in since now, wait, I Before you go off. to AOC's tweet though, just like, like I I've heard it. of Maddie's name. Who, who is he? I, I, he's I, the new like big name in media. Of, oh, let me not say that. Let me say not say that. Like, he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a big MSNBC guy. 
A lot of these right-wing video and social media stunts are predicated on people not knowing the context and just believing whatever the person is saying for face value. For example, in the video, they cut out the part where they waited to yell until a deaf constituent was trying to ask a question so it would look like everyone was mad at their words instead of the fact that they were harming a person with a disability. She initially tried to dismiss it by saying that I was speaking over a deaf constituent or that Kynan was speaking over a deaf constituent, which total lie, by the way. People can just go back to the live stream and see they were reading a question that came in via email from a deaf constituent. If you don't believe me, just go into her town hall that she live streamed, go to about like 49 minutes or so. The assistant who's reading the question says, we just got an email that came in from a deaf constituent. So uh, the next question we received was via email. How can you empower our deaf, disabled, BIPOC youth community to get more involved in government? Thank you. So we received this question via email, and I think it's very important. I think it's very important. I want us to restate that question because even the way that it was submitted is important for us to understand. This question was emailed to us. It was emailed to us. And if you haven't noticed, this right here is um, our live streaming, our live streaming phone. And then that's at the point where we start the intervention. So um, our question, uh, Angela, was the question, how do we get young people with disabilities to become more engaged? You see how she's using that? Who is AOC? You see how she's using that? You see how she's twisting that? And we want to act like this person is going to fight for the working class? Can we repeat that question? I'm sorry, Angela. Just people keep yelling over our neighbor with a disability. I want to make sure that they're heard. So the question was, how can you empower our deaf, disabled, BIPOC youth community to get more involved in government? Honestly, I don't even know if she really meant that defense because when I did the intervention, we had a conference a couple days later, and I was asked to speak on like the motivation behind it and what I thought AOC's reaction was. And my point is that when Kynan and I stood up and yelled at AOC, she didn't see us. She saw the ghost of her former self. She saw somebody herself with that same fiery passion and spirit that she once had. She saw that in, in us, so she saw herself in us. And that's what really freaked her out. That's what really messed with her conscience. Because when you're in that kind of position of power in the Democratic Party, could be also Republican Party, you have to make moral concessions. Okay, I have to put aside my moral compass because if I wanna get something done in Congress, I have to play their game. As Jamal Bowman put it recently, I'm playing the long game. AOC's playing the long game too. And I'm sure if she heard this, she would say, I don't know what I'm talking about because I don't know how things work on Capitol Hill. You know, things aren't as great as I'd like them to be. You have to do this and that. You have to work with this person and that person in order to get what you want. But there was once a time when AOC was saying, you gotta, I don't care if I'm a one-term congressman. You have to go cause a ruckus. And I think what freaked her out is that she was on the other side of that. And that's what happened. And that's what she saw. And that's why she was forced to respond because she had to make it make sense in her own mind to justify what she's doing right now, which is voting for arms and weapons to Ukraine, funding this proxy war, funding Azov Battalion. It's the only way she can live with herself. I had gotten my license in September, and I was like, let's go. Let's go out of state, let's do an intervention. And who was coming to town? Well, not really town, it was Connecticut, it was Yale. It was uh, Mike Pompeo. So we drove up there, and people were giving me a lot of shit. Why do you only do Democrats? Because I live in a Democrat area, what the fuck you want me to do, you know? I've, if I lived in Marco Rubio's district, he wouldn't stop hearing it from me, you know? But Mike Pompeo was the closest thing coming, you know, to a Republican coming to New York. I went up there with Kynan and another friend of ours. And 
you know, Mike Pompeo is the reason why we're in this mess today. Big Russiagate pusher. And actually, Mike Pompeo sat down with William Binney in 2017 at the request of Trump. Because Trump told uh, Pompeo, sit down with Binney. This guy claims he can prove there was no Russian hack. And as Binney tells the story, Mike Pompeo sat down with him at one meeting and said, okay, we're going to be in contact. We'll call you. Don't worry about it. This is great stuff. Never heard from him again. Mike Pompeo knowingly pushed the Russiagate story, knowing there was forensic evidence to disprove it all. So, you know, he partly motivated the Ukrainian war by stoking tensions with Russia. And so we went and we gave him a piece of our mind. I mean, what do you say to a bloodthirsty war monger like that? He said, Mike Pompeo, worst Secretary of State in history. Yeah, and you're right. You are the worst Secretary of State in history. Why don't you tell us about the CIA? You lied. All of these that you implemented, you were Secretary of State. They're the reason that we're currently headed towards a nuclear war with Russia and China. You distinguish yourself from people like Obama, but the two parties, they are the war party. And you are a who has led us towards the war. Talk to us why you killed Soleimani. Why just kill him? You dad for the planet is another third world war. One mistake we made with the Pompeo intervention was not bringing up the Binny thing, because I only thought about it after. I was like, oh shit. That was the whole thing we could get him on. That was the crux of our thing. I mean, not that we did bad. I mean, we got him on Assange, we got him on Syria, drone striking Soleimani. Um, you know, we said that this guy belongs in hell, war criminal. You are the embodiment of evil, and you should be in jail. What you did is really a son. For all the dead children in Syria and in the Middle East, you should be in jail, and you should apologize for what you've done. Will you apologize, yes or no? You are the reason we are in this mess. You five years ago. Go ahead. In the intervention, he responds and says, you know, we saved a lot of people by killing Soleimani. We saved countless lives by spreading You killed people! <laughs> that intervention is, is uh, one of my favorites just because I was able to flex my driving. So the Hakeem Jeffries intervention that I did in February was coming off the heels of the Rage Against the War Machine rally that we held on February 19th. And so Hakeem Jeffries is talking about how uh, he's the Democratic minority leader, he would have been Speaker of the House, and then he starts talking about John Lewis, I think, getting in good trouble. And he gives this story about how when he met John Lewis, he told, you know, John Lewis told him, I don't want to see you getting in any trouble except good trouble. And that's my advice to all the young folk out there. Get into some good trouble. If you see an injustice, expose it. And I agree. The UN Security Council had a meeting yesterday and Ray McGovern spoke to it. He is a former member of the CIA and he testified in support of Seymour Hersh's article on the United States bombing Nord Stream pipeline. You know, the first question in front of me was some guy asking a softball question like, how do we make sure Biden wins again? You know, and how do we make sure there's a majority so you can be Speaker of the House? Boo, fuck you, whatever. 
If it is proven that the United States bombed the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, as has been asserted by Seymour Hersh and his article, will you call for the United States to acknowledge and admit that that was an act of war against Germany and Russia. And I'm asking this because this may be the only way to prevent the rest of us from being killed in a thermonuclear war. And I don't want to be fried. I posed the question to him, which I pre-wrote beforehand because I knew Q&A was coming up. And I just thought, what is something a journalist could take from this, given that Seymour Hersh at the time had just broken the Nord Stream 2 story? Like this thing was fresh, hot off the presses that we have proof that the United States did in fact blow up the Nord Stream 2. Don't you think the media should be reporting on whether or not this is true? And don't you think you should be inquiring into whether or not this is true? And then he just tries to dodge my questions. Well, thank you for the question. And then I go into the intervention. One, I've got no information to suggest uh, that the United States was involved in bombing the Nord Stream pipeline. Because he would have, he, you would have, you would have been, hold on, hold on. you weren't briefed sir, on it. Sir, sir, you got your chance to ask yes, a question. So they have the opportunity to respond. You weren't given information because he explicitly says you weren't briefed on it. Shouldn't you inquire? So here's what I'll say about, I think, you know, President Biden's leadership generally as it relates to the Ukraine. I'm going to speak more generally to the leadership of Mr. Biden in Ukraine. And Russia. We committed an act of war. What are you doing to respond to that? We have to hold Biden accountable. I tell him, uh, you know, not to compete with you, but you're Brooklyn and I'm from the Bronx, something like that. Listen, you're from Brooklyn, right? You know when to call bullshit when you sure. see it. So sure. do I. This is bullshit right now. And I see what's Thank happening you. right now. You know, and then they pulled the mic away from me, and then I said, that doesn't silence me. And so I walked up a few rows, and in retrospect, maybe I shouldn't have done that. That does not silence me. So, you can hear me yeah, right now. You. I okay. want you to say something about the bombing. You know, maybe that could have been perceived as threatening. But hey, I kept my hands up, making sure nobody, you know, I'm not trying to hurt anybody. So. Because we're all going to die from a nuclear war right now unless you stop it and you at least put and inquire into whether or not it's true. This war in Ukraine is going to leave us all dead. And then I just said, I want you to say something about the bombing. So what are you going to do? Because you need to inquire. Here's I'm a New I'll Yorker say. too. Here's what I'll say. Say it. We're going to continue to stand with the Ukrainian people. That's fucking bullshit. Do war. not do that. You will end us all in dead. In this war against We Vladimir need Putin. peace. And before I did the intervention, maybe about 30 minutes before, I think about a month ago, he gave this alphabet speech. House Democrats will always put American values over autocracy. Benevolence over bigotry. The Constitution over the cult. Democracy over demagogues. He could have stopped that D. Economic opportunity over extremism. Freedom over fascism. And he had the audacity to go all the way to fucking Z. Maturity over Mar-a-Lago. Normalcy <laughs> over negativity. And so I remember hearing some pundits say, this is the greatest speech of America I've ever heard. I, I'm noticing on Twitter that it's only dawning on some people that he went through the entire alphabet. This is the night Hakeem Jeffries introduced himself to America. You and I did not realize it until, until we got to W. Yeah. Working families over the well-connected. That was, it uh, was extraordinary, but I will say he did have all week to prepare. So. You know, in my mind, I'm thinking like, what rhymes with airheadedness? Should I use airheadedness? It's a no. battle between how about, truth how about and propaganda, not airheadedness. I stopped at, at, at uh, D, I think, yeah. Diplomacy, not destruction. Battle between okay. tyranny how about and freedom not and democracy, okay. how about truth, and freedom will not prevail. Not cremation, the diplomacy, sure that that not Ladies destruction. I thought the best way to get at him would be to ridicule him with that same speech that he he gave, you know, doing a variation on it. Variations on a speech by Hakeem Jeffries. How about that? Oh, I ask How about you to join it? me. You goddamn airhead, you're gonna kill us all! Hakeem I don't wanna die in a goddamn nuclear war! And we nobody dies!
Are you afraid of what the establishment might do to you now that you're on their radar? No. Will they? I mean, probably. Maybe they already have, and I just don't know how, or they're working on it or something. I guess if you see me in handcuffs in the next six months to a year, you'll know what happened. But, um, you know, I'm not afraid of it. I mean, a lot of people have walked this path. Martin Luther King got assassinated for it. So did Malcolm X. And if you want to include Fred Hampton in that too, Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, uh, you know, it's just the price you have to kind of pay in order to be and do this. So no, I'm not afraid of it. And hopefully other people will start doing this too so they can't kill all of us. People always ask me, like, how do you, how do you just start doing that? How do you just stand up and start going after politicians? So right now we're training other interveners with the Rage Against the War Machine people. And we're trying to really continue to build the coalition of left and right. We're trying to get other people to intervene. Well, the truth is I'm an American citizen. And I know what that means. You know, there's an old saying that goes, know where you stand and then stand there. And where are we standing today? A hundred years ago, this Lincoln Memorial was constructed. And inside, there's a sentence from the Lincoln's uh, Gettysburg Address, which says that we highly resolve that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. But how do you actually do that? My answer is we have to be that free government that we intend to preserve, to improve, or to create. We, not our elected representatives, are the fourth branch of government. The question is, how do you actually do it? How do you intervene? You know, what is the, the, the trick there? Well, the truth is you just, we can do all the training we want, and we are, but ultimately you won't know until you actually are sitting there and you stand up and you do it. Because there's no feeling like the fear you feel when you're doing it and the tension is there and you have to actually break the tension. The training is focused on giving people the confidence to know what they're going to say and giving people confidence to actually stand up and do it. Um, that's what we're focused on and that's what we're aiming to do. How do you know what to say? Who should be the person you intervene on and why you should intervene? And also how to record and capture for social media. And the point we make is that everything you do right now will define the future of the country because our Congress and our Senate and our executive branch are all hijacked. The citizenry has to stand up and be the fourth branch of government and that's what we're training people to do. We are on a fulcrum right now where we can either blow ourselves up or we can advance humanity forward, work with other countries, and develop ourselves to our infinite, fullest potential. And I think the interventions play a big part in moving and pushing us into the direction of good. There's a quote from Edgar Poe, which is really Chamberlain, but Poe quotes this in a story called William Wilson, where he says, um, what say of it? What say of conscious grim, that specter in my path? And, you know, what that means is like, what, why is it the con what, when, these, when these, these congressmen, they have to make an intentional choice to kill their conscience they have to make moral concessions in order to do what they do. And so when you stand up and you remind them that they have a conscience, it's like a ghost that's in front of them. And it stands in front of them and you're showing the conscience to their face. And that is what freaks them out the most. And that has to be used as a way to remind them that they're human too as much as they don't want to admit it.
everybody. That's our show. Russ, got to unmute yourself. <sighs> yeah. Is it uh, it's hooked up properly? Yeah, you're good. You're good. You're All good. right. Cool. All right. Great job, man. Oh, All right. You, everybody man. at home, we can actually hear you because um, we got a hold of some of that Vault 7 technology. The guy just got 40 <laughs> years for us, so we're watching all of you right now. So, woo! There Give the go. man a hand. That was Keaton, man. That wasn't me. Keaton did that. Well, you helped me. I mean, you produced it, and you helped, you know, we put the questions together. You know, you're a writer, co-writer, co-producer. So, there you have it. There sure. you have it. Sure. Um, but he, he's, he's the one who really labored. Yeah, well, I did the editing. I mean, that's that's the work, you know. The the work is we had four uh, hours, especially on a documentary. Yeah, I mean, the hardest part is you have we had four hours worth of stuff with Jose, and you know, Russell and I didn't write questions with the intention of cutting them out. Like you put stuff in because right. you like it, and so there's four hours. So then the hardest part at first is cutting that four down to two because you got to lose half right. your stuff, and it sucks yeah. to lose half yeah. your stuff. The nice thing is we have a YouTube channel, so we could always put out the extra stuff as a clip, right? We could, um, we could do the DVD extras. Yeah, right. We could give you the the, but, the bonus. But, but really, stuff. as some people I noticed in the chat, they noticed, listen, at that time, we hadn't fundraised yet, so we didn't have the money for powder for my forehead. But uh, next time, we should have money for some of that powder so I don't shine so much. Uh, did, were, were people commenting on the shine? Dude, man, I was shining like Doctor Manhattan in uh, in Watchmen. <laughs> I didn't notice the shine. If I see, I'm not conscious of that shit. If I did, maybe I could have color corrected. Uh, no, we, no. It, look, if we if the good send go does well, we should be able to afford a powder puff. Right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But then you know, so the first brutal thing is taking four hours and getting it down to two. Then the second brutal thing is taking two hours and getting it down to one. Right. And then once you have that, you kind of fill it out with music and cutaways and B-roll, and then you got to find the stuff. So, yeah, it's time intensive, but uh, it's I, fun. I, actually, one of my best friends is a professional Hollywood makeup artist. So There you I'll be, go. I, and, he, and he's actually a patron. Oh, beautiful. Excellent. So next time we're getting him on set. Well, we're going to bring in now the guy who really made it possible. Uh, he is our friend and an activist and now a candidate for Congress, running as an independent, New York's 15th. That's Round of right. applause in the chat for Jose Vega, everybody. Woo! Jose Vega, there you go. Beautiful. There's the man. Yeah. Wow. First of all, Keaton, uh, great job. That uh, I, I I mean, I can't act like I haven't seen the documentary already. Or maybe you I saw can. it a couple you know nights ago. Oh, Keaton, that was <laughs> great. I was I laughed. I cried like all just now. It was amazing. Uh no, but actually, I all right. I, go I, back out. Come back in. We'll <laughs> we'll fix it in post. Yeah. No, actually, though, when I did watch it for the first time a couple of nights ago, I did I did cry and I did laugh. That um, the part with uh, 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 my apartment, you know, I had to walk out of the room the second time because I was like, okay, I can't go through that right now. Yeah, yeah, but that's obviously, you know, that was obviously a very formative experience for you, which is why I wanted to keep pretty much all that in i mean we kept pretty much that whole thing in um for for exactly that reason you know i thought it was very it's it's very telling you say in the film you say you know i'm known now as the guy who yells at politicians but i actually started out writing to them calling them asking them for help in all the right ways and uh where did it get me so you know i thought that was a really important backstory you know yeah um and you know you're of the district man you're you're of the earth and the thing that you know i wanted to bring out is that jose really is pro-human jose really loves people you know <laughs> and that's why i tried to communicate that in the montage there at the end and i it was really important to bring gaza into it as much as we could obviously we shot this back in april when world war three was hot on the european front um but you know, I it was really it kind of felt weird putting it out now without getting some of that in. So we tried to to put that in at the beginning with the mad out thing, and then and then more towards the end because um, you know, uh, you really have inspired a lot of these protest actions. You know, you were telling me when you watched it the other night, you said you know, um, the the thing you liked about the montage was it didn't look like you were taking credit for it, but that you were sort of part of a movement and a very influential part of it. And you absolutely are. And so, you know, I hope that came through. But let's... Um, exactly. No, I, I think the, the credit is to the people who actually stand up and do it. 
you know, of course, uh, I've, I have I did, somebody sent me an intervention they did on their congressman this morning um, and I posted it oh, on my wow. Twitter, you know, and like I was like, wow, OK, sure. You know, um, very cool. You know, so but yeah, no, the idea of being part of something larger, I thought was communicated much, much better. And I do have to say, vote Vega.nyc. I'm not trying to be. Oh, yeah, no, we're getting to it. Don't worry. We're oh, not going to bring you we're on here without putting We're getting to it. We got well, you. and also, uh, Masterclass has approached you, right? You're going to be uh, <laughs> you're gonna be doing a Masterclass on these. Yeah, the master, kids. Yeah, That's right. Masterclass Gaiman, in Hellraising by Jose, <laughs> with Jose yeah, Vega. Neil Gaiman teaches writing, rabble rousing by Jose Vega. <laughs> hey, Jake, do you have that link uh, hooked up? There we go. Beautiful. So here's Jose's campaign website, Vote Vega. Dot NYC. I'm going to put the banner up there. Uh, v O T E. I should have done this during the film. Why didn't I think of that? Vote Vega dot NYC. This is where you can go and contribute uh, to his campaign. So, you know, one of the things about this film is, you know, like I said, we shot it almost a year ago and then I had it almost ready in October. And then we're like, oh, let's wait till we do the Mad Owl thing so we can put that in. Then after we did the Mad Owl thing, you told me, hey, I'm I'm probably running for Congress. Oh, yeah. I was like, oh, so when are you going to announce that? Well, next year. I'm like, oh, I guess we're going to have to wait a little longer. But it's it's so worth it that we got to do this at this time because you are running for Congress as an independent in the 15th against Richie Torres. Um, so why don't you talk a little bit about your campaign launch and what the next steps are uh, right in front of you and how people can can help you out? Yeah, well, well, first I want to thank both of you for allowing me to announce and launch my campaign on Jimmy Dore's show. Of uh, course. With Kurt and Mishka. Um, I also saw Steph in the chat here in the in Yeah, the she YouTube was watching chat. for a little while. Yeah, well, they, they just got back from uh, Jimmy's tour a couple hours ago. I think they uh, cozied up to watch this. Jimmy wow. Jimmy came in. He was, uh, he was uh, checking it out. Okay, great. Yeah, well... I'm, <laughs> I'm happy to hear that, but yeah, no, I, uh, again, I want to thank both of you, of course, for, for allowing me to announce my campaign and Jimmy and Steph and everybody involved there. I mean, um, the support that I've received since last night and launching my campaign, I mean, has been completely unreal. You know, people messaging me, people coming out saying they're happy to endorse and support me. And I look, I'm not making any promises to anybody. I've been, I was clear last night. I want to be clear pretty much everywhere I go. I'm not promising you a win, and I don't know if I can promise you any kind of significant vote because of something called electric frog. I think you can piece together yes. what, I, what I'm trying to well, say. Well, you'll do there. better than Marianne Williamson. Electric Marianne frog, Williamson. I like that. I mean, Marianne that, Williamson that is going got... to be the let's go Brandon for 2024. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> electric frog, yeah. Right. Marianne and got so... 2,700 votes in South Carolina uh, yesterday. I think you'll beat that. I think you can get that. Well, I I hope so. But, um, you know, I mean, I, I said in the documentary I was disillusioned with electoral politics, but I've really redefined in my mind what I believe electoral politics to be. And I know Anastasia battles in the chat right now because she can probably speak better about this than I can. But electoral politics is what happened in Chicago last week when you had these high school kids walk out of Chicago uh, of their high schools and say to their city council and to the mayor, you need to demand a ceasefire, you know, and they were chanting, they sat in city hall and they did not relent and they were there when the vote happened and then the ceasefire happened. Okay. And electoral politics is people who are standing up and intervening right now, everywhere we go. Um, that is electoral politics. It has nothing to do with the people we say we want to elect. It has nothing to do with whether we want Trump or Biden or RFK. Electoral politics is dependent on what you are prepared to do. The world is telling the United States, yo, you need to stop waging war for once and wage peace. But they're not talking to the leaders because they know how incompetent our leaders are and the people who actually run this country do not care about people. They're talking to the American citizenry. They're begging the American citizenry, like, please keep intervening, keep standing up. And that's electoral politics. That is what is going to actually cause a real change. But the reason I'm running in the Bronx is because Richie Torres, apart from just being a total IPAC stooge and an IPAC um, 
uh, uh, IPAC airhead. I got to I got to figure out that alphabet IPAC airhead. We'll, we'll figure <laughs> yeah. that out. Um, you know, uh, he was a part of 200 other con congressmen who signed this letter to Blinken calling the International Court of Justice case disgusting. Mm -hmm. All right. Your congressmen think you're stupid. That's genuinely what they believe about you. They think you are so stupid to not understand what's going on in Gaza that they think they can just do shit like that and get away with it. And Richie Torres, who happens to be the uh, congressman of the poorest district in the country, uh, would rather avoid the fact that the buildings are literally crumbling in the Bronx. It was, it was a big story that happened in December where a whole building fell apart. So he's ignoring that so he can fund a genocide happening in Gaza. And, he's the uh, worst there is. I mean, he he's he's the worst, uh, as far as I can see, because it is so obvious that the guy is a complete moron. You know, you did a sort of semi-intervention on him. We didn't feature this in the film because it wasn't one of the more raucous ones because he actually took questions and it was more of a back and forth. But it was pretty obvious in that intervention that you did with him that he knew absolutely nothing about at the time it was Ukraine and things like that. But the, the guy knows nothing. The guy knows nothing except who pays him. And he's so shameless and so void of humanity that he is willing to full-throatedly support the mass murder of over a thousand children a week because of who pays him. And it's just so obvious that that is where he is coming from. It's so obvious that he doesn't actually know enough or care enough to believe anything he says or not That's believe right. anything he says. I don't think he looks into it. I think he knows what he's supposed to say and he says it because that he, that's what he that's what he gets paid to do. And so he's absolutely awful and the people of the Bronx are not with him on this issue. We know that for sure. Right? And so uh that's what gives you a chance to 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 make an impact, you know? Um and the fact that you're not running in a rigged Democratic primary Gives you until November to make an impact, or until May thirty first, because that's when you got to get on the ballot, right? So that's, that's the next hurdle. So why don't why don't we talk a little bit about that, and then we're going to take some super chats, and then we're going to switch to Rumble for the full Q and A. Sure. And also, uh, uh, do, do do me a favor, not to hit you with too many uh, things at once, but talk a little bit about the demographics of your uh, of your district when you can get to it, because I'm curious myself. I'm not quite clear. Like I've been to where you work. That's part of your district, right? Yes, that's right. Uh, Explaining, uh, shit, I, I kind of forgot, Keaton, what your uh, well, no, the positioning. Say, okay, That's so right. First of all, yeah. first of I, I got all, it. No, the, I got the, it. Yeah. I got it. Yeah. I got it. I got it. I got it. Sorry. I. All right. So, people want me to be. They want me to run. They actually want me to win. Uh, I again, I can't promise that, but in order for me to actually be a uh, like, if you want to vote for me in New York City and you want to see my name on the ballot, right, come November. That requires me to have at least 7,000 signatures, okay? But that also requires Diane Sayre to have 70,000, 90,000 signatures because she's a statewide candidate. So let me explain the petitioning process to people. For Diane's campaign, because this is what I have most experience with, for Diane Sayre, uh, in 2022, she ran against Chucky e. Schumer. Um, and now she's running against Kirsten Gillibrand, but... In 2022, for her to be on the ballot, like, so I know Keaton and Russ, you guys saw her name on the ballot under LaRouche ticket, right? In order for that to happen, we needed uh, 45,000 signatures in a six-week window, right? So from April 16th to May 31st, you only have those six weeks to collect all the signatures you need to be on the ballot as an independent. And the, these requirements only came into power in 2020 during COVID or something, right? So think about it, right? So at the time in which you couldn't even be outside to go and get signatures, you had right. to go and get triple the requirements triple. to be an independent right. on, on the statewide ballot. And so right now the plan is for Diana and I to have a fusion ballot so that the signatures I get in the Bronx can also count towards uh, her total. But it's also possible we may be petitioning in different times because they're redrawing the district map again now on the composition of the district so they gerrymandered the hell out of my district to benefit richie torres because there's a subsection of the bronx up in the north called riverdale yeah I don't, I don't, riverdale is where all the money is um, yep. and it also happens to be where a lot of the pro-israel people live in the bronx 
and then this and then it kind of like goes up into an L. So so up L, that's Riverdale. And then down is the South Bronx, where all the poor people are, where the poorest congressional district is. It wasn't like that in 2022. In 2022 and before, it was all the South Bronx. But now they've split the South Bronx in half. And so you only get kind of half of the South Bronx and then a lot of Riverdale. That's how the district is set up right now. And um, the demographics of it is that it's mostly black and Latino with like 4% Jewish. And all of the Jews are up in Riverdale. So right. even even with Riverdale added, it is mostly black and Latino, the district. That's correct. Yes, that's right. Yeah, it's mostly black and Latino. So si hay gente que habla en español, te necesitamos. So that message went out to the people who are, if they understood that, I need them. I need them to you come. You have to teach me some phrases so I can knock on doors. Russ already knows probably yeah. enough to knock on doors. Okay, sí. good. Well, that's, no that's the other... Español en... La How pandemia. about this? Russ can do that. I'll knock on the Jewish doors. I'll knock on the Jewish <laughs> doors. Just show me where those four percent are, and I'll, I'll go. I'll, I'll 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 get them on board. It's gonna but, be tough. It's gonna be tough, but I I, I feel confident. It it is gonna be tough yeah. because Hola. if we don't do Yo it, soy I soy un judeo, pero <laughs> me no gusta Israel. <laughs> <laughs> so. That's the other thing, right? I want to be able to pay people a stipend at the very least of paying them $15 a day and, you know, a MetroCard swipe and maybe a sandwich. You know what that costs? That's like $50,000 just to do that. Just to do that. Just to, I can't even, I can't pay people a full salary. I can't pay myself a full salary. I, I work at a goddamn coffee shop part time. Okay. So people who say this is like a grift for me to get rich. I fucking wish it was, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, and so $50,000 would act like if we could raise that, I could help pay people a stipend just to get me on the ballot. That's. And what's the number it. of signatures you need again? 7,000? 7, 7,000 in my right. district. Yes. And petitioning starts mid April and goes to late May. So you got to get the infrastructure built out so that you're ready to go. See, this is how fucking New York, because it's a gangster fascist thug state. This is how they do it. They squeeze you where you're not allowed to start until after uh, a certain day in April. And then the deadline is made. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. They, they totally rig it for yeah. the candidates with the most funding yeah. because you need yeah. to have a lot of money in mid April so that you go as soon as April there, at the state start. What's the start date, Jose? The 14th? April 16th. 16th, right. So as soon as the 16th starts, you have to be going and, and going nonstop until and when's the, 31st the deadline when you submit everything. May 31st. Six weeks. Six weeks. It's now just look, it's insane. It's, it's just crazy. It, to anyone who has it's a not gangster state. It's like it's yeah. like the mafia. If no, you've never well, this is why before, being from being from New York, anybody who says to me, "Oh yeah, no, you got to vote Democrat for democracy." <laughs> I live in fucking one of the most democratic, one of the most long-lasting democratic states, going back to Tammany Hall. I mean, New York has been dominated by Democrats for almost its entire history. And look look how the voting works. It's one of the most rigged states in the country. So don't tell me you have fucking Democrats defend democracy. Yeah, and, and I just want to say for anybody who's never petitioned before, I mean, it's grueling, it's tough. I was out for Diane every day from like 6 a.m. to 5 p.m., and I was averaging about 100 signatures a day, you know, because it's fucking tough to be out right, there. You have right. to get a thousand no's before you get one yes. And on top of that, then you have to deal with people who are like, well, tell me more about her. Tell me about her policy. So that takes up more time. Right. This is why we need, you know, I mean, as as necessary as your donations are, if you can volunteer, like if you can go on my website and volunteer, that is infinitely way better uh, to sign up and become a petitioner. Like if you can do that, that is probably the most important thing. And I mean, hats off to Diane, because Diane was the only third party candidate in 2022. The Libertarians couldn't do it. The Green Party couldn't do it. We were the only ones to do it. The only ones, the LaRouche people were the only ones to do it. So, All right. Well, we're going to take some super chats right now, and then we're going to take a five-minute break and continue the Q&A over on Rumble. So we'll get through these. Thank you guys very much for tuning in. Um, Donna Manola Barrocal, sorry if I uh, butchered that name. Rest in peace to Mexican cinema actress Helena Rojo. 
apparently passed away today, I assume. Uh, Luzim, Luzim, Azri, thanks for the 199 super sticker. Appreciate that. Dan, giving us some love. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate that very much. Okay, I'll put this up. We'll, we'll put the website up uh, at the end before we close the YouTube stream, so everybody will have one last chance for that. But once again, the website is votevega.nyc. Tusker says, great job, boys. Thank you, Tusker, very thank much. You, That's Tusker. very kind of you. Let's give Tusker a virtual cowbell here. Uh, thank you for that contribution. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um Aspen Fallen, thank you for the 10 bucks. Blown away. Fantastic work, Chance. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Uh, take my money. Go make another movie. <laughs> there you go. Thank you, Hobbs45. <laughs> thank 45. you, Hobbs. Uh, Appreciate that. Uh, but uh, help Jose out, too. Let's get Jose some donations in the bank. Uh, Blarg, thanks for the 10 bucks. Excellent work, guys. Thank you. Kathy, thank you very much. Great job all around. Appreciate thank that. You. All right. Now, DC has a question for Jose. Solid documentary. Love the intervention tactics, but just what was Jose doing in China and Deutschland that he couldn't tell us about? Yeah, you took I was a couple getting brainwashed. I was getting <laughs> brainwashed. I was out there. I was receiving my programming for people who've seen the movie. Um, oh, God, I'm sorry. Ross, you should know this. You're old enough, right? The one about the, you know, where, where you say the word and then it uh, they become brainwashed. Manchurian um, candidate. There you go. That's right. I'm the Manchurian candidate. Don't 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 you don't you see how much skinnier he is? This isn't even the same guy. They <laughs> replaced him. They replaced him. So <laughs> what I did in China was I was invited um, to go and be a part of a delegation of people to go and visit China uh, as part of the Schiller Institute. So the Schiller Institute Youth Movement went to China. We did five days in Beijing, and then we did five days in Chengdu. Some of the best times of my life over there. I mean, we got to see pandas. We got to. What else did we do in China? I'm sorry, that's really all I remember. I have I have Mike here, who is also part of the. Well, what did well, we, that's, what did we... that's that's because you spent most of the time strapped on a gurney, with uh, <laughs> images being fed to you. With what else did we, we uh, did? Sound. We spoke with like government officials. What else did we do? We tried to start a youth dialogue at the top universities. In the country, Tsinghua and Chengdu. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. That, yeah, on a serious note, yeah. So we were invited to like some of the top universities to go and give um, lectures and presentations on LaRouche's ideas uh, because uh, as as much as people are afraid of Lyndon LaRouche here in the United States, if you go to China, his wife, Helga Zepp LaRouche, is seen as like one of the top, they call her the Belt and Road Lady for a reason. And, uh, you know, like we were treated pretty well over there. But, um, yeah, so uh, we were there. We were invited to go do presentations, look at China. Really, it was just to go and, like, learn about China and learn about, you know, the truth about, you know, is China, you know, what, they, what, the, what the Western propaganda says it is or not. And then we went and we report on it. There's a CGTN uh, news spot that was done on it. So... Uh, yeah, that's that's what we were doing in China. In Germany, I was there uh, just to work closely with Helga and the, our Schiller Institute um, organization in Germany. That was it. I was out there organizing, doing what I do over here, just over there, getting a chance to meet the international peeps. That that was pretty much it. Awesome. Um, obligatory black sheep. That was fantastic. Thank you. Please post where we can donate to help Jose. Well, it's votevega.nyc. Uh, let me put that right back up here again. That's it right there. Votevega.nyc is the link. So thank you very much for your support and your interest. Laugh. Great work, guys. Jose for Congress. There you go. You got an endorsement. Beautiful. Oh, Thank you. Laugh. Appreciate that. Oh, yeah. And I went to Tiananmen Square, too. That was like the one thing that totally I was freaked out about. And in China, I was like, no way. I can't. There's no way they're going to let me go here. And they let me go there. They let me they, they go. Actually, you know how patriotic the Chinese are? We got there at like 10 o'clock at night and there was a huge line outside of the entrance. And our guide like asked them like what they were doing there. They were there to go see the flag raise in the morning at 6 a.m. Like this was like a Taylor Swift really? concert for them. Yeah, they were like, "Oh, we want to see the flag get raised." I was like, "What?" Like I thought they were there for some concert. No, they, they wanted to see the flag get raised at Tiananmen Square. I was like, blown away wow. by that. Well, Tiananmen Square. I mean, that's a major tourist attraction, isn't it? Uh, they have a big uh, banner and picture of um, Mao's Mao right? there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 
Scott yeah. says, Jose, diamonds are the strongest material on earth created by pressure. Much appreciation for your strength and courage. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I appreciate all of you who send in great, kind messages. I really appreciate it. Yeah, you've gotten a lot. You've gotten a lot of support. Hopefully you'll get more here. We're going to publish clips from the documentary. If you notice, it's kind of organized in segments, so I'll, we'll drop clips on YouTube, so we'll get the film some more views that way. Uh, Dave, thank you for the 10 bucks, my friend. That was a great film. Thank you. Really reminded me of just how unjust the system is, whether it's NYC or some small town like where I live. Been threatened for my advocacy about minimum wage increases and more. Wow. Uh, thank you, Dave. Sandy says, thank you, Jose, for sharing the Brittany Peterson video today. She also signed the Blinken letter. Jose was our inspiration. Oh, thank you, nice. Sandy. Thanks. Yeah, I th yeah, I think it was her intervention that I posted that she she sent to me. Yeah, yeah, you're making oh, okay. an impact, man. I said oh, that absolutely. on the Jimmy show. I think you've been in a, you know, there's a lot that's uh, causing it, but you definitely, I think, are part of the reason so many people are doing this now. Thank you. Well, you know, again, it's it's a little difficult for me to accept that, um, but I I appreciate it nonetheless. Well, I think it's absolutely true. Um, um, you're definitely the first presenter at the Golden Shoe Awards. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't endorse there being a Golden Shoe Award. I don't. I'm not. He's not down for the Golden Shoe Awards. All right, here's a philosophy question <laughs> for you, Jose. Question for Jose: What are your thoughts on Dugan? I don't know. I've never read Dugan. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Um, Vulture Vanity Show. Bravo. Now go get him at the DNC, gentlemen. Thank you. Please ask Jose to elaborate what drew him to LaRouche. Uh, yeah, it was you, you, we touched upon that a little bit in the film, but he didn't spend much time on it. But go ahead. Yeah. Um, well, I think you kind of characterized it well, Keaton, is that I love people. I really do love, I do love people. I believe that every human being is created in the image of God. And like, you know, I believe that means that everyone has inalienable. You, you believe in God? Do I believe in God? Yeah. What are you, an atheist? <laughs> uh, no, I mean that's going to help because I was going to I was going to ask if I could borrow your car for the road test. <laughs> yeah. You definitely want to believe in God if you're going to say yes to that. Yeah. <laughs> I yes, I am a Christian. I'm a bad Christian because I, you know, I don't know if God would show me as an exemplar student of his teachings but yes i'd like to think i'm a christian and uh i i didn't even know that man a any any denomination no just you know god loves fools. yeah what is it god loves fools <laughs> <laughs> that's what mike just said out here at the in the side but um yeah no uh uh so you know it was the fact that i found an organization that started that as their foundation that like okay if you believe that people have dignity and people are worth living and people ha are worth having a roof over their heads and having three meals a day, if you believe that every individual is truly created equal, what then does policy and culture have to be in order to build upon that foundation? Like that, to me, really attracted me and inspired me. Like, yeah, that makes complete sense. Like, what else should government be doing if not trying to help their population? And not just their population, but the population around the world, you know. And so that's 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 ultimately what drew me to LaRouche. All right, folks. So we have some rumble rants. We're going to take those on the rumble side because we're going to rumble anyway. So the website is votevega.nyc. That is up on the banner right there. Jake's going to put it up on the screen right here. Votevega.nyc. That is the campaign website. Jose is going to stick around with us. We are going to take a five-minute break to give you guys a chance to head over to dodissidents.com front slash rumble. Our producer, Jake, round of applause for Jake, by the way, created this redirect link. So if you type that into your URL, that'll take you right to the current live stream, which is on Rumble. We are going to take more questions. We have Rumble rants. If you are a Rumble ranter, don't worry. We will get to your Rumble rant. Uh, and we're going to take live callers from our patrons, our paid sub stackers, and our paid locals members. You guys are the ones who created the time it took for me to edit this thing. There is absolutely no way in hell I'd have been able to make time to edit this were it not for you guys. Uh, that is time out of the Uber Eats car and <laughs> on my ass in this chair editing this film uh, and without it this would not have happened there's absolutely no doubt about that so thank you all very much so we're going to hear from some callers uh in a few minutes uh but we are going to close the youtube stream and take a five minute break and then we will head 
over to Rumble I, once again. I just, I, I just want to say because there's a little, little, just, uh, you know, healthy discussion erupted about religion in the chat. You know, remember, man, a lot of the people that I think people in our space admire the most, like MLK, Martin, uh, Malcolm X, they both were grounded in religion. And, you know, that's not an accident because so much of what we cry about in this space is how all of our heroes get co-opted or sold out. I think that and I'm not saying it has to be like that. I'm not religious myself. But I think you've had so many great leaders who are grounded in that, in this kind of um, m these moral crusades, because their life is centered in the idea that there's something much bigger than themselves than they're a part of. And I think that makes it a lot easier not to take the money, not to take the easy path, not to take the temptation, because you see your life as something much bigger than your comforts or your needs. I'm not saying you have to be grounded in that, but it seems to help. It helps. It helps. It does help because um, I would say like in moments where I feel as if, you know, I'm doubting myself or I'm doubting what I'm doing or I feel down or depressed, you know, I look back to the fact that this is everything I'm doing is not for me. It's for the future and it's for posterity. It is for the people who will be born. You know, it's for Keaton's kids, kids, kids. That's why I do this. And that helps motivate me. So Yeah, no, that really came through in the interview and, and I, I hope it came through in the in the movie. So um yeah, no, that, that all makes total sense to me as someone who is not personally religious myself. Um but like I said, um votevega.nyc, that's the website. If you're leaving now, remember that website, check it out. Uh, make a donation if you can and support Jose. Uh, but don't leave now. Don't be a party pooper. We got plenty of show left over on Rumble. We're going to take a five minute break. Go over do dissidents.com front slash Rumble. We're going to break for five minutes. We will read all of your Rumble rants over there. We will take chat questions. So even if you are not a patron, you could still address questions to us or Jose. Just please type at do dissidents in front of your message so Jake knows to flag that. And we will see you guys all in about five minutes on the rumble side of the wall, as we like to call it here, West Berlin, uh, where we can speak <laughs> freely and easily to all of our craziest and most depraved fans. So thank you guys very, very much for being here. Thank you, Jose. It was a great pleasure to work with you on this. And uh, I'll see you in five minutes. We'll see everybody else in five minutes. Until then, be safe, be well. Courage. Please clap.